It was meant to be a routine flight, but something was about to go wrong with 138 passengers and six crew members on board. On September 15, 2006, EasyJet Flight 6074 prepared for takeoff from Alicante, Spain. Its destination was Bristol, United Kingdom. Just over two hours in the sky, nothing special. The Airbus had flown this route many times. The weather was calm. The crew was experienced. No one had any reason to expect trouble, but trouble was coming. About halfway through the flight, something happened. The cockpit went dark, screens shut off, radios died. The pilots could no longer talk to air traffic control. They couldn't even see where they were. And what they didn't know was that another aircraft was on a direct path toward them. What happened at 32,000 feet and what happened to the people on board? Watch till the end because the final investigation would reveal a hidden danger that could affect hundreds of planes still flying today. This is the story of EasyJet Flight 6074. It was a warm Friday morning in Alicante. The airport was busy, packed with British tourists heading home after soaking up the last of the Spanish sunshine. The summer holiday season was coming to a close. Families, couples, and students lined up at departure gates, tan lines still fresh. It felt like the tail end of something. Calm skies, relaxed travelers. A final wave before the off-season began. For EasyJet, the situation was far from over. It was getting more intense. The airline had just started upgrading its fleet, swapping out its older Boeing 737s for brand new Airbus A319 jets. And the aircraft scheduled for today's flight to Bristol was one of them. A sleek, modern machine, shiny, efficient, and just a few months old. Everything about it was cutting edge. Except for one thing, experience. Up front in the cockpit, the captain was 42 years old. He had logged nearly 9,000 hours in the air, but only about 400 of those were on Airbus aircraft. Most of his career had been spent flying Boeings. His first officer had just over 3,000 flight hours, 500 on the Airbus. Together, they were still new to the aircraft. Skilled, yes, but still adjusting to a very different system. Before the flight, they had spoken with the previous crew, pilots who had just flown the same plane into Alicante. There had been a small issue. One of the plane's electrical generators, the one powered by the left engine, wasn't working properly. It wasn't serious enough to delay the flight, not yet. There was still a backup generator on the right engine. And as a precaution, the pilots were told to keep the plane's APU, the auxiliary power unit, running for the entire flight. It would provide extra electrical power if anything went wrong. By 10 minutes past 11, local time, everything was ready. The last bags were loaded. Passengers found their seats. 8,000 kilograms of fuel sat in the wings. The cabin doors closed and EasyJet Flight 6074 began to push back from the gate. No one on board could have imagined what would happen next. Because high above the French countryside, the systems they trusted most would start to fail. EasyJet Flight 6074 rolled down the runway at Alicante. It lifted off smoothly into the clear September skies. In the cabin, families flipped through travel photos. A few children dozed off, worn out from the week in the sun. Flight attendants moved down the aisle with snacks and drinks. Up in the cockpit, the pilots guided the aircraft into its cruising altitude, 32,000 feet. The Airbus A319 seemed to be performing exactly as expected. But what no one realized was that a chain of electrical failures was quietly beginning to unfold. Roughly 85 minutes into the flight, somewhere in the skies near Nantes, France, everything changed. Suddenly, without warning, the aircraft's electrical systems began to fail. First to go was the radio. Then the autopilot disconnected. The main system monitor went dark. The captain's primary flight display shut off. Then came the TCS. It is the aircraft's traffic collision avoidance system. It was gone too. Inside the cockpit, the once smooth flight had turned into a chilling game of guesswork. They couldn't see it. No guidance from the plane's automation. They were flying blind on one of Europe's busiest airways. And then something even worse happened. Because at that same moment, American Airlines Flight 63, a Boeing 777, 
was flying directly toward them, and it was just a few miles away. Air traffic controllers in France suddenly noticed EasyJet 6074 had vanished from radar. The transponder was now offline. It is the device that makes the aircraft visible to ATC, and they had no idea where it was going. With time running out, they reached out to American Airlines 63. Could they see EasyJet on their collision avoidance system? The answer came back negative. Controllers quickly ordered the American jet to descend to 31,000 feet, hoping that would be enough. It was only then that the pilots of EasyJet 6074 managed to reconfigure their transponder. Suddenly, the aircraft reappeared, this time squawking 7700, the emergency code. The controller saw the emergency code pop up on his screen. He knew this was serious, but he still didn't know what exactly was wrong or what the pilots planned to do. The pilots themselves were still figuring it out. Their next checklist step was to turn the number one electrical generator off, then on again. The captain did this, but nothing changed. The aircraft system stayed dead. Without cockpit lights working, the captain couldn't even be sure the switch was in the right position. Determined, he kept searching for the problem. They had to find a way to land safely. The captain thought back to something unusual before the failure. The auxiliary power unit had been running the entire flight. Could it be the cause? He shut down the APU and restarted it. They waited for the instruments to come back to life. Nothing. It wasn't the APU. The pilots were trapped in a nightmare, miles above the sea, flying manually with failing systems. What if the first officer's instruments failed next? How would they find an airport? With every minute, options slipped away. The captain called the lead flight attendant into the cockpit. He told her about the emergency and asked her to prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. For the first time, the passengers learned something was wrong. Now the pilots faced a tough choice, continue to Bristol, their original destination, or divert to a closer airport. Diverting could mean flying off course without radio contact. It is a dangerous move that fighter jets might see as hostile. Continuing on the planned route would keep their path predictable and reduce the risk of being mistaken for a threat. Plus, they already had weather information for Bristol. No way to get updated weather for other airports without radios. After weighing everything, the captain chose to keep flying to Bristol. It meant more time in the air, but safer predictability. Down below, London air traffic controllers tracked the silent jet. It was descending toward Bristol, but it wasn't responding to radio calls. Bristol's air traffic control declared a full emergency. Ambulances and fire crews rushed to the runway. All flights in and out of the airport were suspended. Inside the cockpit, the pilots faced a critical test. Would the flaps work? Flaps are essential for slowing the plane during landing. If they didn't deploy, landing would be far more dangerous. At 20 minutes past noon, the captain moved the flap lever. Both pilots held their breath. Then, a reassuring sign, flaps deployed successfully. Their chances just improved dramatically. With flaps extended, they could land at a normal speed and have enough runway to stop safely. But there was one last problem, the landing gear. The captain lowered the gear lever, but there was no familiar clunk, no green light indicating the wheels were down. If the landing gear didn't come down, the plane would have to land on its belly, a risky move that could cause a fire on impact. The pilots didn't panic. They used the Airbus A319's manual gravity system, pulling a lever to unlock the gear door so the wheels could fall into place by their own weight. Finally, the landing gear locked down. Now everything was set for landing. The first officer prepared for touchdown. They agreed that as soon as the wheels touched the runway, he would slam on the brakes and engage full reverse thrust to stop as quickly as possible. In the cabin, passengers waited unaware of the danger their pilots had just navigated. The captain tried one last time to call Bristol Tower on his mobile phone. Still no luck. They had to land without clearance or radio contact. The plane touched down smoothly. The first officer slammed on the brakes, engines roared in reverse. Slowly, the plane came to a stop. After a tense and strange flight, all 144 people on board were safe. But the story was far from over. Why had the aircraft vanished from radar? What caused the failures? 
And could this happen again? If you're finding this story gripping, take a second to like this video for more real aviation stories and share it with someone who flies often. Because what investigators uncovered about this near miss could affect more than just one flight. Now, let's find out what really went wrong. At 2.52 that afternoon, the UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch, the AAIB, was officially notified. Because the aircraft was an Airbus A319, built and designed in France, French investigators from the BEA also joined the case. Airbus itself offered full cooperation. What investigators found was disturbing. They began by looking at the flight path and radar records. It turned out that EasyJet Flight 6074 had come dangerously close to American Airlines Flight 63. The two aircraft had intersected flight paths over western France at high altitude in busy airspace. At exactly 11.02 and 16 seconds, American 63 passed through the same spot where EasyJet had flown just 19 seconds earlier. At that moment, the two planes were separated by just three nautical miles horizontally and only 600 feet vertically. It was one of the closest calls in British aviation in years. And the most alarming part? Neither crew had any idea how close they came to disaster. The reason? The traffic collision avoidance system never sounded a warning. Investigators discovered that TCAS had been completely disabled on the EasyJet aircraft due to the electrical failure. Without that system, the aircraft couldn't see other planes nearby. And for TCAS to work, both aircraft must have their systems operational. EasyJet's was dead. From here, the investigation turned to why the electrical systems failed in the first place. Data retrieved pointed to a single point of failure, ACBUS-1. It is a major power line that delivers alternating current to critical systems throughout the plane. This was not just a minor circuit. AC Bus 1 powers key systems, radios, autopilot, displays, warning systems, and more. Its loss would cripple the cockpit. But what caused AC Bus 1 to go offline? The answer came from deep inside the aircraft's systems. Investigators examined the generator control unit, GCU, for the left engine. This unit manages power flow from the engine's generator. During the flight, the GCU had tripped into a protective mode known as the welded GLC protection function. It sounds technical, but in simple terms, it means the system detected that a key electrical switch, called the generator line contactor, might be stuck or malfunctioning. To prevent further damage or fire risk, the GCU took the generator offline. The result, a cascade of power loss. With ACBUS-1 down, systems began to fail one by one. What made the situation worse was that the auxiliary power unit had been running since takeoff. Normally, the APU is used on the ground or in emergencies, but on this flight, it had been left on. The captain thought it might be the source of the problem and shut it down mid-flight, but this only made recovery harder. The aircraft's power supply was further weakened, and the system never recovered until they were well into descent. The investigation concluded that the protective shutdown by the GCU was a correct response to a potential fault. The aircraft had done what it was programmed to do. But the combination of small oversights and the failure of a single component led to a near disaster. Since the incident, changes have been made. Better fault detection, pilot training on deep electrical failures, and protocols to ensure faster system recovery are now part of standard procedures. And the A319's architecture was re-evaluated to reduce risk in future flights. This was not a crash, but it could have been. And sometimes, the disasters that almost happen teach us the most. Thank you for watching. If you found this story compelling, make sure to subscribe to our channel. We cover real aviation cases that deserve to be remembered and investigated. And if you want to support content like this, don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. We'll see you in the next one.